we kneel as far as possible for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I pray that you will be with us on the Sabbath day. Help us to receive the blessing that you have promised each and every one of us. I pray that you will enlighten our eyes and help us to understand this subject. I pray that you will fill me with the Holy Spirit and that the words I share will not be my words, but that they will be the words that you have given to me to share with your people. I pray that we can all settle into, settle into the truth intellectually and spiritually so that we cannot be moved. Help us to gain the experience of knowing you as a personal savior from sin. I pray that you will be with us in our lives day by day, not just on the Sabbath, but as we moment by moment walk uh, closer to you as unto a shining light uh, that shines in a dark place till the day dawn and the day star arise in our hearts. We, for, we pray for the day star, Jesus Christ, to arise in our hearts this next hour. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. <coughs> so today's study, we're going to be looking at uh, Daniel chapter 8. But before we go there, I would like us to turn to Matthew uh, chapter 24. Uh, we're going to be looking at the everlasting gospel. And this is a very important gospel, is it not? Mm. And it's important for us to understand this gospel, amen? Mm -hmm. And so, let's look at the gospel that Jesus taught, because our Savior would <clears throat> teach the gospel that we need to be proclaiming here at the end of the world, amen? amen? So, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, the Bible says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, for witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. So Jesus says this gospel, this specific gospel, is the gospel at the end of the world that needs to go to all the nations, and then the end will come. So what is the gospel, this gospel that Jesus is talking about? Anyone? Verse 15. Verse 15? Okay, let's read verse 15. <clears throat> When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by who? Daniel. Daniel the prophet. Stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. understand. So Jesus told us that the gospel that needs to go to all the world is the prophetic gospel based on the book of Daniel. And it includes us understanding the abomination and desolation. Jesus tells us that this is a command, and Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he wants us to understand what is this abomination and desolation. And keep in mind in verse uh, 3, what are the three questions that the disciples ask him at the beginning of chapter 24? When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And then so for the next chap, uh, then Jesus goes on to the sermon explaining these answers, the destruction of Jerusalem, the end of the world. So this is a prophetic chapter that Jesus is saying, this is the gospel that needs to go to all the world for a witness. And I want you to turn with me to the next page, I mean the next chapter, verse, uh, chapter 25, verse 1. The first word says, then... What does that word then mean? Connection with that. So, exactly. In connection with the chapter 24, the, the sermon on the end of the world and last day events, then Jesus is continuing the exact same sermon, and he begins explaining the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. He says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like, likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps, and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, and five were foolish. <coughs> so these virgins, in context, including Matthew 24, these have to be describing a church that is living in the last days. This cannot be uh, any other uh, virgins. 
Do we all see that? Amen? Okay. And so you have these two classes, the wise and the foolish, the righteous and the wicked, the, the wheat and the tares, the lamb, uh, the sheep and the goats. And so, but the Bible calls them the wise. Now, who are these wise? It's the same wise that Jesus tells us we need to understand in, uh, in the book of Daniel. So let's turn over to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 11. Daniel 11 and verse 33. Amen when you're there. Amen. Daniel eleven thirty three. the Bible says, And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil, many days. So the Bible talks about these people that understand they're going to instruct or they're going to be teaching many. Now let's go over to uh, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. And they that be what? Wise. Wise, Wise shall shine as the brightness <coughs> of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness, these are the same many that they that understand will instruct many. They turn many to righteousness as the what? Stars. The stars forever and ever. And... We know the word wise here in your margin is what word? Teachers. Sister said it in the back. So they that be teachers are going to shine as the brightness of the firmament. So the wise spoken of in Daniel, they're <coughs> going to be teachers. They are they that understand and they instruct many. And they turn many to righteousness. Um, Jesus wants us to be teachers of the everlasting gospel. And in order to teach, we need to understand. And so dealing with this wise even more further, drop down to verse 10 of chapter 12. Many shall be made purified, made white, and shrouded, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So this is important to notice that there's only two classes of people uh, described. There's the wise and the foolish. You have um, this same wise right before Jesus tells us about the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. He's telling us, go understand the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel it says the wise will understand. But in contrast in verse 10, there's a class that is wicked and there's a class that is wise. And the Bible says, none of the wicked will understand. So we need to ask ourselves, um, if we don't understand the everlasting gospel, the book of Daniel, what Jesus told us to understand, then what class does that put us in? <coughs> Foolish, the wicked. So, amen. What are they going to understand? Let's continue to read. In verse 11, and from the time that the daily shall be taken away, that's one, the abomination that make it desolate, desolate, that's two, set up. Isn't this what Jesus said that we should understand, the abomination of desolation? There shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days, that's three. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the, to the thousand three hundred five and thirty days, that's four. So, the wise are going to understand these three things. The daily, the abomination that make it desolate, the 1290 days, this 1335 day prophecy, and the wise are the teachers. Now, these four things, are you able to teach them? Can you teach the daily? Yes. Can you, do you understand... The, what is the abomination that make it desolate, and can you teach it? Are you able to articulate your beliefs to someone else who doesn't know? And the 1290, can you explain and walk someone through how we come to the 1290, and what is that blessing of the 1335 for those who wait and come into the uh, 1335? The wise will understand, and we need to be able to teach these things. 
So, by God's grace, as Peter said, even though you know these things and be established in the present truth, I will not be negligent to put you always um, in remembrance of these things. So we're going to go over a little review for some of us, and also hopefully this will help us to settle into this truth so that we can be among the wise and be able to teach these important subjects. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's look at our quote. Our, our, uh, we're going to begin our study on this uh, daily, which Jesus and Daniel told us we <coughs> to understand, the wise will understand. What is the daily? And early writings, page 74, paragraph 2, uh, is a very crucial quote. It says, Then I saw. What does that mean, I saw? She was in vision. She was in vision. Now notice, then I saw in relation to the daily. So Sister White specifically had a vision in relation to the daily. Amen. And there's not, and uh, that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text. And the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment hour cry. When union existed before 1844, nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily. But in the confusion since 1844, other views have been embraced, and darkness and confusion has followed. Time has not been a test since 1844, and never again will be a test. Now there's nine things I want you to notice from this, from this quote. First of all, that God gave Ellen White specifically a vision in relation to the daily. And second, that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom. So for us to take a view of the daily being anything to do with the sacrifices or the sanctuary services of the Jews, then our foundation of this view is based on man's wisdom. Amen. And third, the word sacrifice does not belong to the text. Amen. So don't read it. And when I skip over this, it's because it was supplied by man's wisdom, and it doesn't belong in the text, if anyone's curious. <clears throat> and then four, she says that the Lord gave the correct view. So there is a correct view of the daily, which is also implying that there is an incorrect view of the daily. And who had the correct view? Who gave the judgment hour cry. Amen. Those who gave the judgment hour cry. And then... Uh, the sixth point I want you to notice is before 1844, nearly all were united on this correct view of the daily. Since 1844, other views have been embraced. <coughs> so I would be uh, weary or leery of other views that have come into Adventism after 1844. A uh, question, I mean, the eighth point is these other views, notice what they brought. They brought darkness and confusion. And in our Sabbath school lesson, we were studying about who? Babylon. Babylon. This is, uh, these other views of the daily that came after 1844, they brought attributes of Babylon. And when you look at it, really what Adventism did is they went back to the old view of what the... Um, the, Babylon, the, the daughters of Babylon were teaching. They were teaching that the daily had to do with the sanctuary services. And this is a Babylonian belief. And a good article I would encourage people to study is an article called, Does 1844 Have a Pagan Foundation? It goes over the history of the views of the daily held by various reformers <coughs> and how Miller was the only person in history to come to the conclusion that the daily is paganism. Amen. And these other views after 1844, they're really just going back to the old Babylonian views. And then the ninth thing I want you to point, to point out is that time has not been a test. People say, well, this isn't talking about the daily, this is talking about time setting. And they want to sidestep this issue that God specifically gave her a vision I saw in relation to the daily. Um, and they want to say all of this, the correct view of, of time setting. But this was actually a separate and distinct vision given to Ellen White. Um, and you have the reference right there, Review and Herald, November 1, 
1850, where she actually has a vision. I saw that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord. Then I saw that um, in relation to the daily, and then, it, then I saw uh, that time had not been a test. Then I saw that people are trying to go to the old Jerusalem, and they will never uh, come back. <coughs> so all of these are actually separate visions that she saw. And the compiler of early writings, for some reason, put them together. And, and that has brought in some confusion, people thinking that it is um, talking about time setting. And so really all we have to ask ourselves is, if those who gave the judgment on the cry had the correct view of the daily, then what, what, is, what is their view, amen? So it's very simple. This should be enough to completely stop any argument or controversy. This should be enough. But for many, unfortunately, it's not. So we need to ask ourselves, when was, what is the judgment hour cry? And uh, we can read from early writings, 232.1. Angels of God accompanied who? William Miller. William Miller in his mission. He was firm and undaunted, fearlessly proclaiming the message committed to his trust. Notice what the message given to the trust of William Miller is. He ceased not to preach the what? The everlasting, the everlasting gospel. So Miller preached the everlasting gospel to crowds wherever he was invited, sounding far and near. The cry, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. So what is the judgment hour cry? The everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel and specifically the first angel. Amen. Amen. So Miller, notice Miller was the messenger who proclaimed the first angel's message. And uh, this, he gave, he was one of those who gave the judgment hour cry. Our pioneers gave the judgment hour cry when union existed before 1844. And you ask any of the pioneers what they believe the daily was, it was paganism. And Miller, um, notice it says that part of the everlasting gospel, the judgment hour cry, included the correct view of the daily. So, what it, the daily, the correct view of the daily is part of the everlasting gospel. Amen? Mm -hmm. So this is the everlasting gospel that we are still today to know and understand as Jesus was explaining this gospel. So let's read uh, Josiah Litch. She gave also the judgment hour cry. Let's see what he believed. And it says... The this is, yeah, coming from Josiah Litch. The daily sacrifice is the present reading of the English text, but no such thing as sacrifice is found in the original. This is acknowledged on all hands. It is a gloss or a construction put on it by the translators. The true reading is the daily and transgression of desolation. The daily transgression being connected together by the word and, the daily desolation, and the transgression of desolation. There are two desolating powers which were to desolate the sanctuary and the host, the church, and her metropolitan. Me Metro metropolis. 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 Metropolis, thank you. They are paganism and popery, as will be shown in large in another place. So he's saying that... When we read Daniel 8, 13, that how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation, the word and connects and shows that there's two desolating powers, the daily desolation and the transgression of desolation, the daily being paganism and the transgression of desolation being popery. And James White, Sister, uh, Sister White's husband, he stated, the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation represent Rome in its pagan and papal forms. Leaving out the supplied words, the text would read the daily and the transgression desolation. There are two desolating powers. First, paganism, then papacy. So, Josiah Litch and James White, and also when you look on the 1850 chart, it says, uh, under 508, that pagan dominion, or the daily, was taken away. And then it quotes... Uh, Daniel. So, 
the judge, those who gave the judgment our cry were the same ones who put together the charts. And they had the correct view of the daily. So let us continue on to Daniel chapter 8, though. We're going to look at the verses that deal with this subject. So in Daniel 8, let's do some review. How does Daniel 8 start? With what animal? A ram. And the ram has one horn higher than the other. And then that ram, then the he goat with a notable horn, he hits the ram and then it waxes great. And then that notable horn of the he goat, it breaks into four pieces, right? So, uh, one, uh, while we're here, I want to deal with one argument that people use is that the uh, Daniel chapter 8, the ram and the goat, this is sanctuary language, right? that these are sacrificial animals. And so, just the context of Daniel 8, this is dealing with a sanctuary in Christ's Jewish sacrifice, sacrificial sanctuary. But, uh, but can it really be? And the answer is no. And why cannot these, the ram and the he-goat be represented by Christ's sanctuary? Yes, they're represented by kingdoms. And also, that these animals had blemishes. Because can God use a sacrifice with anything other than without spot or without blemish? No, no it can't. And the ram, the ram had one horn higher than the other. That's a blemish. And the he-goat had broken horns. That's a blemish. God could not use them in his sanctuary. <coughs> but, yes, they could be used for sacrifices in a sanctuary but it would be a pagan sacrifice. So I just want to put that on the record. And so this is where we come on after Greece is divided into the four different kingdoms. In verse 8, this is where we will begin our study. <clears throat> Therefore the he-goats waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones, towards the four winds of heaven, north, south, east, and west. And in verse 9, And out of one of them came forth a what? A little horn. Now, this little horn, it's not saying that out of one of the horns, the little horn came forth. It's out of one of the directions, particularly the west came forth Rome. And uh, in Daniel 8, Verses 9, 10, 11, and 12, we're going to find the little horn being talked about. And there's two phases of this little horn, both pagan Rome and papal Rome. And we know this, that the little horn is not always papal Rome in these four verses, uh, because it says, out of one of them came forth the little horn. <coughs> Did papal Rome conquer Greece? No. No, it didn't. Pagan Rome conquered Greece. And then... Uh, papal Rome took over uh, uh, pagan Rome. So in verse 9, we see this is pagan Rome represented by the little horn. Do we all see this? If we all see the same, amen. Okay. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great towards the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. Verse 10. And it... Uh, wax great. And this is important to notice too, is because in these verses, you have different genders being talked about in the original language. You have the transitions between male and female, male and female. And this is very important for us to understand because um, what does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? A church. So when in these <coughs> verses, the Bible talks about the little horn being a female, then this is going to represent the church, Babylon, the mother of harlots. She is a woman. And then the male, when the little horn is referred to as a male, it's going to be representing pagan Rome, the civil government of uh, pagan Rome, before it became a church. So in verse 10, it uses the word it. And it's probably because the translators uh, didn't recognize the transition between pagan and papal Rome. They believed the little horn was uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. That's why they added the daily sacrifices. Those beliefs go hand in hand. But uh, <coughs> when it uses the word it, it's because it's the female gender pronoun in the original. And so it, the papal Rome, waxed great, 
even to the host of heaven, and it casts down some of the hosts of the stars to the ground and stand upon them. Who are the stars? There's several things. Pagan. No, pagan. Um, yes, that's true. They are um, pagan deities. Um, stars are were one third of the angels fell from heaven. They became like gods for pagan nations. But uh, the papacy did not cast down to the ground and stamp and persecute the pagan deities. But it was like the same stars in Daniel 12:3 that they that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever. So it, uh, from what I understand, this is God's people who, this is highlighting the persecutions of the papacy of uh, stamping down God's <coughs> people to the ground. But uh, verse 11, it says, Yea, he. So notice this is male. So which phase of Rome would this be? Pagan or papal? Pagan. Pagan Rome magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him, pagan Rome, the daily was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And so, um, we're going to look at this daily, because this daily is the word uh, tamid, which means continual. And to understand what is this daily, uh, we need to understand what, what is this continual, what are they continually doing? And turn with me to Psalms chapter 74. Hold your finger in Daniel 8 or a place because we're going to be basing this study off of the book of Daniel. So let's go to Psalm 74 and uh, verse 22 to 23. We're looking, what are they daily, continually doing? Psalm 74 and verse 23. I'm sorry, verse 22. The Bible says, Arise, O God, plead thine own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches thee, what? Daily. Daily. Forget not the voice of thine enemies, the tumult of them that rise up against <laughs> thee increases continually. So, um, this is talking about the foolish men that is reproaching daily, the enemies, they are rising up continually, the Tami. And, uh, and Psalms 14.1 says, The fool has said in its heart, there is no God. So this is talking about the foolish man, the atheist, the pagan idolater of self-worship. This is, they are continually transgressing God's law. <coughs> daily is the paganism, according to the Bible. And uh, if we go back to Daniel chapter 8, uh, we're going to look at this word, taken away, because it says that uh, by him, the daily, or paganism, was taken away. And to understand this, it's helpful if we uh, look at this word, taken away, in the Sean's Concordance, H7311, it's the word room which doesn't mean like I'm taking this computer and I'm ta taking it away and I'm, I'm putting it or removing it, but it means um, exalted, to exalt self, to rise up. It's dealing with proud, to take away, to lift up, to promote. So uh, you have the definition on your handout. This room is to exalt and dealing with pride. And yea, he magnified himself. This is the self-exaltation. This is a connection of the daily power. Excuse me, is that, spelled, is that pronounced room or rum? Almost like room? Room. Okay. Because uh, if, I don't think it's on your handout, but on the Sean Concordance, it tells you how you can pronounce it, and it's spelled R-O-O-M without any accent. So from it's room. And um, so this room that by him the daily was exalted, or paganism was exalted. And we can, um, and wouldn't it make sense that uh, paganism, exalt, uh, that pagan Rome exalted paganism? Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, by him the daily was exalted. Uh, let's look at, 
Yeah, let, let's look at this um, self-exaltation. Let's look at <coughs> Jeremiah chapter 48. <coughs> Jeremiah 48 and verse 26. Jeremiah 48, verse 26, the Bible says, Make ye him drunken, for he magnified himself against the Lord. Moab also shall wallow in his vomit, and he shall be in derision. Read verse 29. We have heard the pride of Moab. He is exceeding proud, his loftiness and his arrogancy and his pride, and the haughtiness of his heart. Verse 42. And Moab shall be destroyed from a people, because he magnified himself against the Lord. Now Moab, is this a pagan nation or a Christian nation? This is a pagan nation. A paganism exalts themselves, it's self-worship. This is not, um, it is not following the laws of God. It is not being obedient to the Creator. But this is self-exaltation. And so the daily, um, would, would be the pagan Rome exalted pagan, um, paganism. So let's look at the uh, other daily, because the words taken away in chapter 8 is the word room, which means exalted, but the word taken away in chapters 11 and 12 is a different word, which is uh, sir, and that is literally to remove. And so let's go to Daniel chapter 11 and verse 31. We're going to look at this other word taken away. Daniel 11:31 the Bible says an arm shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away which is the remove the daily sacrifice they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate and so again we have this repeat and enlarged taking place the daily is mentioned again in chapter 11 and but this time the word <coughs> taken away is the word sir, which is uh, removed. And that's uh, Strong's reference, H5493. And um, so this is when the daily is actually removed. But drop down to verse 36. I want you to notice this power in verse 36. <coughs> and the king shall do according to his will, and he shall what? And in verse 36, Daniel 11, 36, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself, and magnify himself above what? Every God. Every God. Notice this. And he shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. And we know that uh, Revelation 13, 5, I believe, says that the beast is going to speak great things and blasphemies against um, the Most High and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, <coughs> nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. So this, this is uh, important to realize he's going to exalt himself, he's going to magnify himself, he's going to speak great things against the God of gods, He's going to exalt himself above all that is God or that is worshipped. And we can find that if you turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, this is where Paul is borrowing his language from Daniel chapter 11, 36 and 31, Amen. dealing with the, uh, the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination of desolation. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse... Uh, three. The Bible says, oh, there's still some pages turning. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, the Bible says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, 
except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself. This is the language from Daniel 11.36. Mm -hmm. Above all that is called God, or that is worship, uh, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. <coughs> if you're a man of sin, and you are showing yourself that you're God and receiving worship like God, what is that? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. And that we know this from... Uh, John chapter 10, verse 30 through 34. So this is all the exact same language of Daniel 11, 36 and 37. He's going to magnify himself. And verse, um, verse 5 is very interesting. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? So Paul is saying, hey, don't you remember? We've studied this together. <coughs> I told you these things. And now you guys are forgetting. You're misapplying Bible prophecy, and uh, he has to correct them. Let no man deceive you by any means. Paul was not negligent to teach them on the important subject of Daniel 11 to the church of Thessalonica. Amen? Mm -hmm. And in verse 6, and we're looking at the word taken away in connection with the daily. Uh, the daily needs to be taken away. <clears throat> and now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time, dealing with the papacy. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth, or he who now is restraining, or keeping, or holding back, he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. That is the same language of Daniel 11.31, the daily to be taken out of the way. Um, and then that then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So, what is <clears throat> restraining or hindering popery from being revealed? Pagan. Why, it's paganism. Amen. So, the daily that needed to be taken away in order that popery may be set up, the abomination of desolation, was paganism, according to Paul. And we can continue to read in verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and, and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God <coughs> shall send them what? Strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned to believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And we find the context dealing, this context that we're reading about is dealing with the daily in Daniel 11. And this strong delusion is in connection with the false view of the daily. And we are told that before 1844, nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily. Since 1844, other views have been embraced and Darkness and confusion follow. This is the strong delusion, brothers and sisters. And uh, it says because they had, they loved not the truth, they believed not the truth because they had pleasure and unrighteousness. Same thing that Daniel 12 is saying. Or, yeah, Daniel 12, 10. That the wicked will do wickedly. They have pleasure and unrighteousness. But none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. You need to understand the everlasting gospel, brothers and sisters. <coughs> and so, now let's turn. We're still looking at this word, taken away. Let's go back to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12 and verse 11. Daniel 12 and verse 11. The Bible says, And from the what? The, the time. The time that the daily shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. So, now we have a problem. For those who are holding on to the view of the, the daily being Christ's high, heavenly sanctuary ministry, now you have to associate a time. You need to attach a time prophecy to the taking away of Christ's 
uh, high priestly ministry by the papacy. Because there's two views, I forgot to verbalize this, but there's two views, main views, are taking place. One is the old view in Adventism that <coughs> is the, those who gave the judgment our cry believe that daily was paganism. And this new view since 1844 that have came into play has been um, that they believe that the daily is Christ's heavenly high priestly ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. And so, uh, because of the reason that uh, of Daniel 12, 11, it says that the daily, and if it is Christ's priestly ministry needs to be taken away, this is the starting point of this 1290. And so, when you begin to share this with people, they, they have a problem um, making this uh, make sense. So this is where people begin to want to say, well, the daily in Daniel 8 is Christ's priestly ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, but the daily in 11 and 12, yeah, that's paganism. They want to hold to the view 508, which is when our pine, those who gave the judgment out of cry, I believe the 1290 begins, the 1335 begins, um, and this says the taking away of the daily, and then it quotes the verse that we're reading. And so they want to still hold and believe that the daily being taken away is 508, which starts at 1290. But at the same time, they want to say the daily is Christ's high priestly ministry. Christ's priestly ministry did not take place in 508. And we can't have, this is why people are trying to say, well, I believe they're both. <laughs> but brothers and sisters, can it truly be both? Can Christ be Satan, and can Satan be Christ? Yeah. Is paganism the same as Christ's high priestly ministry? <clears throat> no. It's either one or the other, and we need to be consistent all throughout Bible prophecy. So let's go back to Daniel chapter 8 and verse 11, and we're going to wrap up this uh, taking away. But we're going to read Daniel 8 and verse 11, but, and we're going to read this the new view way, and we're going to see what those who have the new view believe this is saying in Daniel 8.11. So, yea, he, the little horn, which most of Adventists just say, you know, the little horn is, is a papacy, and that's that. You don't recognize there's a distinction between pagan and papal. So, yea, he, the papacy, magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Okay, I can see that. Papacy did that. And by him, the papacy, the daily Christ priestly ministry was taken away, or which we know is lifted up or exalted, and the place of his Christ sanctuary was cast down. And so let's think about this: the papacy lifted up and exalted Christ's heavenly ministry. Is that, isn't that confusion? That is Babylonian. That that's not right. But now let's read it. By him, it's a male pronoun, so this is the pagan Rome. Pagan Rome, um, by him, was, oh, the, by pagan Rome, paganism was lifted up and exalted. Now, that makes way more sense. And, uh, Amen. yeah, so it's just confusion. And it, and it doesn't line up with the interpretations of if we hold that the daily is Christ's priestly ministry. So now let's look at these sanctuaries because um, a, a common misunderstanding is that the people they, that hold the new view, they say, well, this, this uh, sanctuary in verse 11, this is the same sanctuary that's spoken about in verse 13 and 14. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. It's the heavenly sanctuary. But we need to keep in mind that there's actually two sanctuaries being talked about in Daniel chapter 8. And so let's read Daniel 8.11 one more time. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily was taken away, and the place of his pagan Rome sanctuary was cast down. So usually when we think of the word sanctuary, we think of either the Jewish sacrifices or the Jewish Old Testament, the earthly sanctuary or Christ's heavenly sanctuary. Um, we think of something godly with this word sanctuary. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. But do pagans have their own sanctuary? Yeah. 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 Yes. So let's see this from the Bible. Isaiah chapter 16. If you will turn with me. Isaiah 16. We're going to look at 
three witnesses that will show that, yes, pagans do in fact have their own sanctuary. Isaiah 16 and verse 12. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass, when it is seen that Moab is weary on the high place, that he shall come to his sanctuary, Moab's sanctuary, to pray, and he shall not prevail. And again, Moab is this pagan nation. And the Bible says uh, that he shall come to his sanctuary. So, the Moab had a sanctuary. Now let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 18. The Bible says, this is speaking about Lucifer and um, it shows that the king of Tyrus was a type of Lucifer in this description. So we're dealing with the pagan nation of Tyrus and Lucifer and um, this worship of I will be like the most high in verse 18. Thou hast defiled thy what? Sanctuaries. Sanctuaries. By the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquities of thy traffic, <clears throat> therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all men that behold thee. So the Bible says Satan has sanctuaries. And also, we won't have to turn there, but it's on a handout. Uh, 1 Samuel 5, verses 1 and 2, where it was talking about the ark being taken, and it was brought into the pagan house of their god, which the Dagon. And uh, so that house of their god was, um, the house of Dagon was a sanctuary. It was their temple, their place of worship. Pagans have uh, sanctuaries. And so if we go back to Daniel chapter 8, and we need to keep in mind that there's actually two sanctuaries being talked about. And in the original uh, word for the word sanctuary in verse 11 is the word, uh, is the word mikdash. And this is on H4720. And mikdash is dealing with anything. This is the word sanctuary. It's anything that is consecrated or holy. It could either be a pagan temple full of idols or it could be God's sanctuary uh, that is holy. But the word Kodesh, however, is the word used in verse 13 and 14, dealing with the 2300 day sanctuary. And Kodesh can only mean uh, something that is heavenly. It can only mean the sanctuary of God of heaven. And so in the, these, this chapter, there's two sanctuaries being mentioned. And verse 11, it says the place of <coughs> sanctuary, Mikdash, pagan sanctuary, um, was cast down. So, does uh, does Rome have a? Does pagan Rome have a sanctuary? The Pantheon. The Pantheon. Amen. And so, uh, the Pantheon was a place where they would conquer people, their nations, and then they would assimilate their gods, and they would set them up in the Pantheon, and they begin to worship all of these <coughs> many gods. And so, uh, they they would do this, but the the place of the Pantheon was cast down because uh, Constantine moved all the idols out of the Pantheon and moved them to Constantinople. And so no longer are they worshipping uh, just in raw form of paganism, but now they are worshipping under this cloth of baptized paganism. All the same Catholic, all the same pagan rites and ceremonies and traditions, but now it has a disguise or it has a Christian name under Catholicism. And so, uh, the place of his sanctuary, the Pantheon, this is cast down. So the whole issue of the daily had nothing to do with Christ's high priestly sanctuary. It was actually the Pantheon that was cast down. And I want you to, to just try and think about this. Spirit of Prophecy told us that pantheism was the alpha of apostasy, right? Pantheism was being brought into God's sanctuary in uh, his church. So pantheism being brought into God's sanctuary was believed by Adventists to be the alpha of apostasy. And what are people trying to do when they make the pantheon Christ's 
sanctuary ministry. They are bringing pantheism into Christ's sanctuary once again. They are making the, the pantheon Christ's heavenly sanctuary. And um, do you guys know how much time I have? Anyone? Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes? Okay. I would like to uh, read this quote dealing with this sanctuary because um, this is about the time where people would like to bring up this article by Crozier and um, who brought in this, this new view that the, the daily is Christ's uh, sanctuary <coughs> ministry and the holy place. And so let's read this quote from Word to the Little Flock, page 12 and verse 8. It's very <coughs> interesting. She says, I believe the sanctuary to be what? Cleansed. Cleansed. So she's dealing with the cleansing of the sanctuary. At the end of the 2300 days is the New Jerusalem temple, of which Christ is a minister. The Lord showed me in vision more than a year ago that Brother who? <coughs> Brother Crozier had the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary, and that it was his will that Brother C should write out the view which he gave in the Daystar Extra, February 17th, what year? 1846. I feel fully authorized by the Lord to recommend that extra to every saint. Now that's a powerful endorsement, isn't it? And so in this uh, endorsement, Sister White is mentioning that Brother Crozier had the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary. But in that sanctuary, in the day star, um, in the in the uh, yeah day star extra, he included this false view of the daily being Christ's high priestly ministry, and so people will take this uh, endorsement and they say, see, everything in that um, in that article is is correct. It's inspired. It's endorsed. It's infallible. That is the correct view of the daily, which is taught in that original article in February 7, 1846. But I want you to notice um, that she says, she's taught, she brings this, um, this <coughs> paragraph, she begins it with, the sanctuary to be cleansed. And that Brother Crozier had the true light on specifically the cleansing of the sanctuary. And does this mean that the entire article is without error? Or does it mean that he's correct on the cleansing of the sanctuary? Because he was the first person in Advent history that I'm aware of that uh, with higher medicine, they got together, they studied out what is the cleansing of the sanctuary, and they realized it's not the earth as they were taught in all the schools and every Christian uh, uh, church believed, but it was the heavenly sanctuary. Mm -hmm. So this is the true light, the advancement of this cause of the Millerite movement, and uh, so this is true light. But does that mean the whole thing is, uh, is without air? And I want you to know a little background of Crozier. He, he learned from the Sabbath from Joseph White and um, in the same year of 1846, but the very next year, he joined a guy named Joseph Marsh, and he ended up opposing both Seventh-day Adventism, the Sabbath, and the sanctuary teachings. And he began endorsing the age-to-come theory. And it was unfortunate, but he continued to preach in a, a different church until 1940 when he died. But um, I have your references on your handout, and I want you to notice to these... Look at these dates on here at the bottom of your page. Here's a timeline of what takes place. So in the Daystar Extra, February 7th, 1846, Crozier's original article was published, including having the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary, but he included this false view of the daily in there as well. And then, in April 21st, 1847, Ellen White wrote this endorsement word to the little flock that Brother Crozier had the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary. So, what does James White do? As a result, he republishes Crozier's article in September 1850 in the Review, and the first time that James White republishes his article, it includes Crozier's false view of the daily. And uh, then, directly after, Sister White has that famous quote, the original uh, of early writing 74, but the original 
a vision is given in the Review and Herald, November 1st, the very same year that he publishes, but republishes of Crozier's false view of the daily. And then she has a vision specifically about the daily to correct the false view that was being brought in. And that those who had the judgment out of cry had the correct view. And that Brother, Brother Crozier is um, this new, new view, these other views since 1844 um, have brought in darkness and confusion. And so as a result of Ellen White's vision that is recorded in uh, early writing 74, what does James White do? He republishes it, but this time when he republishes the Daystar Extra of Crozier's article, he takes out the two paragraphs, two very important paragraphs that are dealing, that are identifying the uh, daily as being Christ's ministry, they're gone. It's almost like in his article, when I read it, it's kind of interesting, he's explaining and he's going on about um, the Christ uh, the sanctuary that was cleansed being Christ, and he says, let's go to Daniel, and, it's, and then it like just cuts off. And when you compare the, the original and then James White's republished one, um, it cuts off and it just completely skips. And it like clips out all that that's talking about the daily being Christ's heavenly ministry, and it's missing. And then it kind of restarts where it left off. And it kind of reminds me if like um, we are on stage or, or you're teaching some something and you have the mic, and uh, then you go on and start talking about air, and then they cut off the mic, and then you're like, oh, this guy is not correct. Let's let's cut that out, and then he republishes it. So, um, so James White, as a result of Ellen White's correction of this false view, he re republishes it without the air. And I want to deal with this, uh, when Ellen White endorses something, does that mean that it's without error and that everything in there is infallible? Because, exactly. And Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, Ellen White, um, in the book um, Publishing Ministry 356.2, she tells us that uh, thoughts, thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, I know of no other book that can take the place of this one. It is God's helping hand. So she endorses the book Daniel, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, but is this book without error? No, he has the false view on the king of the north. He Amen. believed it was Turkey. Amen. But the Bible says the king of the north is Rome. And without Uriah Smith's book, identifying the king of the north as Turkey, if you were today to try and show that just using Bible verses, just using the Bible, you could not come to the same conclusion. And so, though this book was endorsed, it's not totally infallible. <clears throat> and the same thing with the book Pilgrim's Progress. I'm going to read you a quote. She, she actually has quite a few endorsements about the book Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. John Bunyan. This is, I don't know what HS stands for, but HS, page 151.2. The Pilgrim's Progress, written under these trying circumstances, portrays the Christian life so accurately and presents the love of Christ in such an attractive light that hundreds and thousands have been converted through its instrumentality. Now, that's a powerful endorsement of the book Pilgrim's Progress. But is this book without error? No, it isn't. Because uh, in this book, it, he has the wrong view of the state of the dead. The very ending of the book, they have to cross over the river before they get immediately to the, um, the celestial city. And that was symbolizing passing through death when you go straight to heaven. There's another guy who knocks on the door of, of the celestial city representing heaven. And he doesn't have an invitation. He was a thief and a robbery. He came up some other way. And then he's trying to come to heaven, and they're like, where's your invitation? And he doesn't have it. So what happens? The, the ground opens up, and he falls down to the gates <coughs> of hell. And there's another place where the guy directs Pilgrim, um, or directs Christian, and to the gate of hell, and he, they see souls and stuff that are burning in hell. And so the book's not completely without error. If you take the view that when Ellen White endorses something, that the entire article or the entire publication is without error, then you ought to change your view on the state of the day. And so, if we just simply look at the endorsements uh, one more time, it said, Brother Crozier had the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary. I do not believe he was correct on the daily, 
but the portion of the cleansing of the sanctuary, just as this quote reads, is what he was correct on. And so, yeah, I wanted to share that. But for time's sake, let's just go through Daniel 8, 12, and uh, we'll close here shortly. Daniel 8 and 12. 8 verse 12. The Bible says, And host. What is a host? A it's a group of people. And Numbers chapter 10 and verse 8, we won't go there, but Numbers 10 8 identifies a host as an army. So the Bible says an army was given him. And notice how that word him is italicized. Mm -hmm. It's because originally that, that word him, that male pronoun, is not there. Uh, this is actually dealing with papal Rome. A host, an army was given to papal Rome against the daily by reason of transgression. And it, see it says it because translators, it's female and they don't really know how to um, make that consistent. So they put it, papal Rome, cast down the truth to the ground. And it practiced and prospered. <coughs> so verse 12 is dealing with papal Rome. But an army was given to Papal Rome. Why does Papal Rome need an army? She doesn't have one. She doesn't have one. And Daniel 7.24 says that she needed to subdue uh, three kings before she comes up. And so uh, the army was given to the Papal Rome. It was against the daily. It was against uh, paganism that they were fighting against with this army that was given to them. By reason of transgression. And what is this transgression that uh, this host um, comes. And there's some verses there that we don't have time to go over, but I will kind of briefly summarize what they're saying. Jeremiah 2.20 identifies that transgression is fornication. And would we all agree that fornication is transgressing the law of God? And so for a church to commit fornication, how does a church commit fornication? We studied it this morning. Violation for of the law. Yep, violation of the law. And the church is married to her husband is Christ. And so if she goes out on her husband, she's seeking the military might or the sanction of the church and state. Church and, state. and so uh, when church and state come together, this is an unlawful relationship. And this is why Revelation 17, too, Babylon has uh, committed fornication with the kings of the earth. And so this host given to the papacy was transgressing the law of God because they were committing fornication. Church and state should not be together like this. Amen. And it cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced and prospers. I want to read a short quote from Great Controversy 65.1. <coughs> what is this it power that cast down the truth to the ground? As foretold by prophecy, the papal power cast down the truth to the ground. So that's very clear this is dealing with papacy. And she's mm -hmm. quoting from Daniel 8, 12. The last thing, and then I will be closing. Uh, let's look at the 2300 days. Uh, Daniel 8, 13 and 14. If you don't get anything, please get this. Daniel 8, 13 and 14, the Bible says... Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So, um, the question is, how long is going to be the vision concerning these two desolating powers? The daily is connected with this vision of the 2300 days. And the transgression of desolation is connected with this vision of the 2300 days. The question is how long, what is the time connected with this vision of chapter 8? And the answer, 2300 days. So we, do we see a connection with the daily and the 2300 days? Yes. Amen. So what power or what nation began the vision in chapter 8? 
it was a ram, and that was Medo-Persia. Uh, Medo -Persia. It was the ram. And so Medo-Persia, is that a Christian or a pagan nation? Pagan. 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 So that would be um, <clears throat> the daily. And so uh, this vision concerning the 2300 days, have you ever wondered why, um, why it, like God uses repeat and enlarge, repeat and enlarge? Daniel 2, what nation does Daniel 2 start with? Babylon. Babylon. Daniel 7, what nation does that start with? Babylon. Babylon. And then you get to Daniel 8, what nation does it start with? Medo-Persia. Why is it Medo-Persia? It seems like it throws off the consistency. Because the, the Babylon had gone already. But has Babylon gone already? Let's actually read verse 1. Daniel 8 and verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto Daniel, after that which mm. appeared unto me at the first. So it's not gone. I had the same question. Um, maybe it was because Babylon was gone away, but Belshazzar was a Babylonian king. So Daniel has this vision of chapter 8 still in the year of Babylon. Why does it begin with Medo-Persia? And the reason why is because God is trying to direct our mind to give an establishment of the time period. When does the 2300 days begin? The Bible says, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation? The answer? Time period. The, yeah, the 2300 days. And what nation does the 2300 days start with? The pagan nation. Which, which nation specifically? Medo-Persia. Medo Medo-Persia. We know it was the Persian king Darius, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, Daniel 9 gives us the starting point of the 2300 days. But in Daniel 8, um, it gives us a starting point. It gives us a clue as to when the 2300 days begins in the pagan nation of Medo-Persia. And so, this is why I believe it begins with Medo Persia, because Daniel 8 is dealing with the chapter, I mean, the vision of the 2300 days. And so, this 2300 days has to begin with the daily. Do you see this? Medo Persia, represented in this case, this pagan nation. And so, now let's try and, and substantiate. Um, we have these two views. I mean, it can't be both. It's either Christ ministry in heaven, or it's the day, it, it, or it's paganism. And so, let's just say, if the daily is Christ's ministry in heaven, what is the earliest time that you can begin the 2300 days? When did Christ go to the holy place? 31 AD. 31 AD, when he ascended into heaven, he began his priestly ministry. This would begin the daily, because before 31 AD, if it's Christ's high priestly ministry, the daily did not exist in the time of Medo-Persia, right? Mm. Okay, so the 2300 days could not begin in 457 as the daily view begins the 2300 days. So if the 2300 days begins with the earliest time it could begin is 31 AD. So, so 2300 days Add 31, you got 2,331. We still have roughly 300 years till the fulfillment of the 2300 days. And what does that do to our church? Then the Seventh-day Adventists, they no longer have a faith. The Christ is not in the most holy place. The Advent movement means nothing. Spirit of prophecy is false. The, um, everything we teach and have taught is false. Our whole religion is a lie, and this false view of the daily directly attacks the foundation of 2300 days. And when you read the article, does 1844 have a pagan foundation? It really shows you that the only view that can come to the conclusion that 2300 days starts on 457 is if you believe the daily is paganism. Because Everyone else, with every false view of the daily, they have thrown off the starting point of the 2300 days. And the Protestants, the Babylonian daughters, uh, before Miller, he was the first one to recognize this, they started it with Antiochus, or they started it with some <coughs> other uh, time periods. But Miller, because of his view of the daily, he came to the conclusion that the 2300 days has to begin at 457. He was the only one in history. And this is both the foundation and central pillar of the Advent faith. 
And so um, I just want to close with showing that this whole issue of the daily, it really isn't, the daily is not in question. And our pioneers understood this is not what the whole issue is. Like, like Stephen Haskell, they understood that this daily is questioning, identifying the daily is questioning the, the spirit of prophecy, the validity of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is our foundations. This view of the daily, it either um, supports or destroys Adventism. And this is um, what the end result is. I mean, you have um, A.T. Jones, Wagner, Conradi, they had the false view of the daily, and as a result, um, many of them, like uh, Wagner, began to doubt the spirit of prophecy, and he was one who actually said that the quote from Early Writing 74, yes, that shows the daily is paganism. And he said, if you just use the Bible, you'll come to a different conclusion. He began doubting the spirit of prophecy. He gave up the, the writings of Ellen White on the view of the daily because he couldn't substantiate his view from her writings. And so he cast that aside. And a lot of people in our history, when you go through, which I'm out of time, so I can't do that, but uh, people, this false view of the daily has really led people to apostasy. You have, you have modern days like Ford, and um, what that resulted. So, one last verse, and we can close. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. God declares the end from the beginning. Amen? Amen. So we are going to declare the end of this study from where we begin. Matthew 24 and verse 14. Hopefully now you see why is it that Jesus said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. God wants us, your Savior wants you to know, read, and understand what is this daily power of Daniel. Can we all close with a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we uh, come before you and it is our prayer that you will help us to see where we are in this world's history. And Lord, open our eyes to help us to see that this isn't an issue of just identifying who a paganism is or, uh, or who the daily is, but this issue is about your people, your covenant, the relationship you want us to have with the understanding that Christ is in the most holy place. And He is going over the books. He is wanting to blot out our sins. And Lord, we pray that You will uh, forgive us of our sins. Help us to uh, give us a desire. Because it's not something that we can muster in ourselves. But give us the gift of repentance. So that we can repent and be converted. True uh, Christian conversion. I pray that we can be like Christ. And help us as we go throughout the rest of the Sabbath. Help us to remember that it is a Sabbath day. And that our words will not be spoken on your holy day. And that our thoughts and conversation may be heavenward. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. An easy way for you to do missionary work is by clicking like on our YouTube video or leaving a comment below. Because, did you know it notifies your friends, thus encouraging more people to watch and learn? Subscribe to our YouTube channel because we have a new video every Friday as well as a whole library of free videos covering a variety of important topics. If you enjoyed studying this topic, then click on this related video or check out this suggested video instead. We have more written Bible studies on walkswithgodministries.com. I hope this video has shed more light on your walk with God. Thanks for watching and have a great day.